Brilliant, so let's get going. Um, for those of you who've just joined, I'll introduce myself again. I'm uh, Rob Dunn. I'm a barrister at Park Lane Plant and Chambers. Uh, my practice is about 5 to 10% personal injury and uh, the 90 to 95% is employment. Of that, I act for claimants and respondents, but probably, again, around 90 to 95% for um, respondents. Um, thank you very much for joining today. Um, what I intend to do is this. Um, we've got a talk today on uh, Section 15 of the Equality Act 2010, and it's a, a summary of the key parts of Section 15, um, what a claimant has to do to substantiate a claim, what a respondent has to do to defend it. Um, I'll try and um, flag some key cases as we go, um, some useful cases for arguments that uh, often come up for both claimants and uh, respondents, uh, but also um, a couple of recent cases, um, one in particular in the last few months, which um, is particularly pertinent on the issue of causation in section 15. Um, so it'll be good to look at that uh, as well. So I'll get going with the slides uh, and hopefully you can uh, see these uh, now. Um, brilliant. So uh, there's myself uh, and there's a, a little bit about um, Park Lane Plowden and um, unsurprisingly um, how, how great we are, but, but there you go. Um, right, so outline of um, this lunchtime. Um, we're going to look at Section 15 itself, some preliminary points, the issue of knowledge of disability. We won't touch on disability itself, but, but knowledge is, of course, pertinent for a Section 15 uh, claim. There is the uh, something arising point, Paper treatment, the causal link, um, how tribunal approaches it, and justification. So uh, let's get uh, cracking. Um, there's section 15 um, in its glory, um, words you'll be familiar with, uh, uh, no doubt. Um, some of the key phrases, of course, we'll look at all of that idea of unfavorable treatment and that specific wording for causation because of something arising in consequence um, and what that's uh, likely to mean. But a few preliminary points before we get going. Um, it's of course worth um, recalling why we have section 15 and the root of it can probably be traced back to this House of Lords case, um, Lewisham, London Borough Council and Malcolm. Um, it's a case where a uh, an individual called Mr. Malcolm, and he had a, a flat in Lewisham, and he sublet it, which he shouldn't have done. Um, that was against the terms, uh, and he was given uh, notice to quit, and his tenancy was terminated as a result. And he said, well, the only reason um, that I sublet my house when I wasn't supposed to was because I had uh, schizophrenia and therefore I'm disabled. And this is essentially something that's very connected with my disability. Uh, so essentially what you've done at Lewisham London Borough Council is you've um, terminated my tenancy because of my disability. So I should win a direct discrimination claim. And um, it went to the House of Lords and eventually they said uh, no. Of course, this is the reason why Section 13 claims are so tricky in a disability sphere, because you need a comparator. And the comparator in Mr. Malcolm's case would be someone without a mental disability, such as um, a schizophrenia, who'd also sublet a flat in Lewisham. And of course, anyone without that disability who'd done the same would have been treated the same as Mr. Malcolm. So he lost. Um, which, of course, leads to the idea of something arising being um, pertinent in Section 15 claims. Um, of course, therefore, you don't need a comparator. Um, claimants got to be disabled. Claimants got to have standing. What I mean by that is they must either be an employee 
uh, or be a uh, what's termed usually a worker under the uh, under the Equality Act. Um, no service criteria, of course, such as uh, unfair dismissal claims and time limits um, uh, judged from the date of the uh, unfavourable treatment. One other um, preliminary issue um, is this, and this is the extent to which Section 15 overlaps with indirect discrimination in particular, but also reasonable adjustments claims. Because, of course, if you have a, let's say, that the standard Section 15 claim that, that is often seen where someone is off work because of a disability, their absences are something which arise from the disability. And if they are dismissed because of those absences, they have a prima facie Section 15 claim. Now, quite often, you could, um, as a claimant, you could run the very same facts as a Section 19 claim, indirect, or Section 2021, reasonable adjustments. So, of course, a Section 19 claim would be something along the lines of there being a PCP of a certain level of service being required. Um, the particular disadvantage for the disabled person would be that they'd find it harder to meet that PCP themselves, and there would be that group disadvantage as well because of their disability. Um, and uh, the uh, justification uh, would be uh, similar as a defence for the Section 15 claim. For the reasonable adjustments claim, you'd make a similar point as a claim, and you'd say, of course, the PCP is a requirement to um, a certain level of attendance at work, um, and the substantial disadvantage would be, well, that's difficult because you're, you're disabled, that's, that, that's trickier. And the reasonable adjustments would be um, potentially numerous, but they, of course, would feed into whatever the Section 15 justification would be. So these matters and these questions overlap. So, so why do I raise it? I, I raise it because of um, some of the wording that's given there from well, Justice Elias in uh, the case of Griffiths, um, which I imagine many of you are um, familiar with, and it flags this um, uh, this overlap. And from a tactical perspective, I've often found as a respondent, these are the sort of arguments you can make at a preliminary hearing to try and almost encourage a judge to encourage a claimant to thin out their claim. Um, a claimant who brings these um, allegations, section 15, section 19, section 2021, the same facts, um, it's incredibly unlikely that they would um, succeed on the section 15 claim, but lose on the other two. And if that's the case, why do you need the other two? It makes it more complicated for everyone. For section 19 claim, they're going to have to show group disadvantage. They don't have to do that for a section 15 claim. Section 2021 20, claim, they're going to have to set out all the reasonable adjustments. They're going to have to set out a PCP with clarity. Uh, these are all tricky points. And um, what's the point, essentially, if you've got a Section 15 claim? Now, one argument might be for Section 19 claim, you don't actually need to show knowledge um, of disability, which you do for a Section 15 claim. Um, but there's, um, there's a case law that suggests that um, uh, in reality, that would feed into the justification defence on the Section 19 claim in any event. So you're probably not any better off bringing in a Section 19 claim. So um, if there is, uh, you're faced with a Section 15 and a Section 19 claim, um, do consider uh, the extent to which you might be able to encourage a claimant, represented or not, or particularly a judge at preliminary hearing, to encourage a claimant to, to thin those out and um, the section 19 and perhaps even the 2021 and um, are usually uh, weaker. Um, so going back then to section 15, um, I'm going to start at the end of section 15 um, because it's usually in fact the first question that, that one looks at uh, this issue of um, knowledge because of course, subsection one, so that's the test for uh, section 15, does not apply if 
um, the respondent doesn't have knowledge of the disability. Um, so what are the elements of that? Well, of course, it's actual and constructive. Um, so it's what you knew and what you ought to have known. It's an objective assessment. It's of all the constituent elements of disability. So again, as a respondent in particular, just because you know that someone has an impairment, um, you might even know it impacts their life in some way, but do you know, or ought you reasonably uh, uh, have known, um, that it has the long-term um, substantial adverse impact, for example? So just because you are aware of something as a respondent doesn't necessarily mean that you have actual or constructive knowledge of all the elements of disability, which is worth bearing in mind. Um, the disability code um, from the EHRC is useful as well, uh, and I'll come on to that in a moment. Um, but two particular cases that, that, that can be uh, useful. Um, the first one is um, A and Z uh, limited. Um, now, this was a case where um, the company um, referred to as A limited uh, were found by the tribunal to have constructive knowledge of the disability. Um, it was a mental health disability um, because before they dismissed uh, Z, uh, they had received some GP certificates and the hospital's uh, uh, documentation, which suggested that there was perhaps a mental health issue there. Um, and this really goes to the issue of constructive knowledge. So they said, well, look, there was documentation there um, that suggested there was a mental health issue. If you had, um, essentially that's enough for, for constructive knowledge. It suggested there was, there was something there for you to look into. Um, and um, it went to the EAT and the EAT found that actually there wasn't constructive knowledge in that case. And that's for this reason. Z was an individual who suppressed information about their mental health. And they had a history of suggesting that they were able to, to work normally. Um, they didn't necessarily want occupational health examinations either. And um, the EAT found that actually what the tribunal should have done is taken the next step and asked the question, well, if inquiries had been made about these documents, um, what would have happened? And actually, um, what they found would have likely happened would have been that Z would have continued to suppress information about uh, their mental health. They wouldn't have allowed um, A Limited to um, have full information about their health, how long it had gone on for, what the real impact of the mental health uh, on Z was. So it's a helpful point for respondents, just because um, perhaps your client knows something about there being some sort of condition, doesn't mean they know about, or ought to have known about all the elements of disability, but also if they had asked the question um, and looked a bit further into it, would they have gone anywhere? Would they just have been met with perhaps another uh, brick wall? It can be a useful uh, defence that for, for respondents. And one point that can be a warning for respondents then and useful for claimants uh, is the case of Gallup and Newport City Council. Um, that was a case in which um, the uh, occupational health advice when the question was asked, suggested, as is often uh, uh, the case on occupational health reports, that um, there was uh, unlikely to be disability uh, in that case. And they essentially relied upon that and they said, well, we don't think you're disabled because occupational health have suggested that. Um, and it went all the way to the uh, EAT. They said, um, fair enough. Um, Court of Appeal, however, um, disagreed and remitted the matter to the tribunal. 
Um, and they said the key question is whether the employer had actual or constructive knowledge of the facts constituting the claimant's disability. And Lord Justice Rymer said an employer can't simply rubber stamp um, an occupational health advisor's opinion. It must make its own factual judgment. And in that case, there was um, evidence um, around the occupational health report um, suggested uh, in the claimant's behaviour, for example, um, that suggested there was um, more going on and that more had been going on for um, adequate time. Um, you couldn't just rely upon what occupational health said. So perhaps a useful point for uh, claimants there uh, as well. Um, one further point on constructive knowledge, which is useful, it's this idea um, that the code, the EHRC code, is um, it gives quite a lot of examples on what sort of things might constitute constructive knowledge. So it's always worth going back to that. Um, we don't have to rely upon case law or even statute. The code can be very persuasive. Um, and it gives this example of something which might be um, sufficient to, to give constructive knowledge. This um, disabled person, uh, in this case, um, they have a good attendance and then something changes. They become emotional, they become upset, they become late for work, they make mistakes. So a few things that are um, out of the ordinary come up for this um, person and they are disciplined without being given an opportunity to, to explain themselves. Um, they are the sort of things which could trigger um, uh, constructive uh, knowledge. So the next question, um, going back therefore to uh, section 15.1, so uh, the test for something arising from disability, um, the prima facie test. Um, a good place to start is the something arising. Uh, and the claimant uh, will have to, of course, identify something arising from their disability. Um, it's worth as a respondent to, um, of course, try and get the claimant to identify that as clearly as possible. Um, understand what the causal links are that get from the disability to the something arising. And for reasons I'll come on to, try and make sure that something arising is clearly defined in a list of issues um, or by the uh, tribunal and a case management uh, hearing. Um, it, it, it's very broadly defined uh, and the EHRC code is again helpful. It can be anything which is the result, effect, or outcome of a disabled person's disability. So it can be symptoms, it can be an inability to do something, um, it can be something like a restricted diet, there can be multiple causal links. There could be symptoms which lead to an inability to do something, which lead to something else. Um, you can have a number of links there as a, as a claimant, as long as you can um, prove it, of course. And T Systems uh, and Lewis uh, said it just has its uh, ordinary and natural meaning. Um, that brings us nicely on to uh, the case of Grosset, which caused huge consternation uh, when it came out, um, but it's still good law. Um, there can, of course, as I've said, be numerous causal links that take you from the disability to the finally pleaded something arising. Um, and it is not something that the respondent has to know of. So that is typified by the bizarre case of Grosset. Um, there was a claim, uh, claimant who was a teacher suffering from cystic fibrosis and um, was disabled and it was accepted um, in the um, hearing that the uh, claimant was disabled. And uh, the claimant um, said that they had an increased workload. And that's because, because of their cystic fibrosis, they had to do um, a, a significant and increased exercise regime. And when the um, extent of this exercise regime was put with the uh, that the stress that many teachers have at work, um, that made them 
particularly stressed. So it was this idea of the high workload combined with the exacerbated impact of trying to um, control their cystic fibrosis. And, and the claimant said that actually the um, stress led them to show this film Halloween, um, an 18 rated film um, to um, a class of 15 year olds. Um, so it could have perhaps been someone, um, it could have been worse, but 15 year olds are still not great for teachers showing um, what seems to be, I haven't seen it, but um, uh, doesn't look like an overly um, uh, appropriate or um, perhaps enjoyable film, uh, maybe each of their own. But that's what, um, that's what the teacher did. And the um, teacher said before they were dismissed, that's why they'd done it. They made the link. They said, look, I'm completely stressed. And it all, well, at least in part, goes back to my cystic fibrosis. Um, and it's worth thinking what you might have thought if you were the employer in that position. You might have thought, well, um, I don't have any evidence of that. Um, how could I know that that was a link? Maybe that's something that you think was entirely unlikely to be a link, perhaps due to the remoteness of it, perhaps due to the number of um, uh, causal links the claimant had to make. But the uh, claimant was successful um, and uh, it went to the uh, Court of Appeal. And the finding was you don't need to know of the something arising. Again, that um, rather foreboding quote, um, the employer genuinely did not intend to discriminate because of disability, but that is not the question. Um, it's perhaps questionable whether that was the statute's intention, but, but there we are, that's the position and that's good law. Um, so that can of course cause significant issues for respondents because you might not as a respondent, know that um, your uh, employee is disabled. You might not have actual knowledge, but because of those matters that we looked at in the code, you might have constructive knowledge. And then arising from that disability via two, three, perhaps unlikely causal links, you may have a something arising that you could not possibly know had any link to the disability, but you still might have um, the something arising proven. Um, because of course, uh, constructive knowledge is enough for disability and you don't need to have knowledge of the something arising. Um, I had a um, fascinating case recently um, in a warehouse and I was for the respondent. Um, fortunately, or perhaps unfortunately, because it would have been interesting, didn't get to a final hearing. We um, we got it dismissed on a time point, but the claimant's claim was this. The claimant worked in a warehouse and he climbed, completely unexpectedly, climbed under a conveyor belt, crawling under this moving conveyor belt, getting injured as a result um, to access the toilet. And again, you might think, um, what on earth is he doing that for? He admitted it was a breach of health and safety and he was dismissed um, because of it, serious breach of health and safety. Um, he was uh, found to have committed gross misconduct. Um, maybe you think that's that. But again, section 15 comes in because the claimant said he had diabetes. He said because of that, he had to drink more water. Because of that, he often needed the toilet urgently. And that is why he had um, done what he'd done to try and access the toilet in the way he had. Um, and on the face of it, that is a, a feasible, I'm not saying he was likely to succeed, but it's, it, it's a feasible Section 15 claim. Now, I think we would have been all right because... Um, the claimant would still have to prove the causal links. And I think we would have, the claimant might have struggled to show 
that even if he had um, diabetes, which he did, and even if that did cause him to drink more, which it probably did, he might struggle to show that that um, caused him to need the toilet with such urgency. And even if he could show that, he'd have to show that it needed, uh, it required him to need the toilet with such urgency that he um, was to do something um, as um, dangerous as crawling under a conveyor belt. And of course, there would have been another way around, which might have taken him 30 seconds or, or a minute longer. Um, but the point I make is simply this, that um, something like that is, is not out of the question as any, when, when one looks at Grosset, um, it's not out of the question as a potential section uh, 50 way. So that then leads to the next part of the test. So you've got um, knowledge, you've got something arising. Um, unfavorable treatments, um, usually uncontroversial um, things like uh, critical comments, um, dismissal, warnings, those sort of matters are not very likely to be um, or will be um, unfavorable treatment. There are a few cases though where, particularly as a respondent, you can argue that there is not an um, unfavorable treatment. Um, and um, I set uh, them out there. They are usually cases where there is treatment which is actually beneficial for disabled people, but it is not quite as beneficial as it perhaps could be. So I'll give two examples, one of Williams and one of um, a relatively recent case of Cowie. Um, now, Williams um, worked for Swansea University, uh, ended up going down to part-time hours and then ended up retiring for um, ill health and was granted ill health uh, retirement. Um, and part of that um, involved, uh, part of the pension involved what was called the enhanced element. And the enhanced element was um, a benefit um, that um, was given um, on ill health retirement, and particularly for people who um, were disabled. But it was calculated by reference to the claimant's part-time salary. And the claimant essentially said this, well, my part-time salary is something which has arisen from my disability, and there's unfavorable treatment because actually my enhanced element has reduced because I'm on a part-time salary. I'm worse off because of this thing that arises from my disability. And um, claimant won in the ET, um, but ended up losing in the Supreme Court. And uh, essentially they said in the Supreme Court, you need to be very careful in defining of the treatment. The treatment was the award of a pension with the enhanced element. And essentially it could have been more favorable, but just because it was not more favorable did not mean that it was unfavorable. This enhanced element um, was something which would have been um, unavailable to, to many people. Um, and the claimant got it when many um, wouldn't have. And just because that was calculated at a lower rate based upon uh, a part-time salary, which yes, arose from disability, does not mean that a slightly reduced enhanced element was unfavorable treatment. Um, a similar case at Cowie Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. Um, this is uh, something that happened during COVID. And those in the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service who were shielding um, were given a special type of paid leave. Um, so those who were shielding get this special type of paid leave. But the condition was that um, they had to use up their annual leave before getting the special paid leave. Um, again, claimant won in the tribunal, but lost in the EAT. And the tribunal again said that the EAT said, you have to be very careful to look at the treatment. The special leave was the treatment, and that was something that was more favourable. This was something that most people didn't get. 
And although it could have been more generous because it could have had no conditions, you could have just got the special leave, that doesn't mean that putting conditions on something which was favourable treatment made that unfavourable. It was still um, favourable treatment to get this um, special leave. Um, one shouldn't... Um, uh, one needs to be careful to look at the conditions of the entitlement and also the, the, the benefit. Just because you've got a... Um, uh, treatment which could be more favourable in, in the way it was given does not mean that it is um, favourable. Um, so that takes us to the causal link and a good place to start um, is the case of um, NISA, Pereza, um, and uh, NHS England and another. Um, it sets up four uh, useful questions uh, which are a good way to approach analysis of section 15 claims. Um, section um, 15 and Panesa um, go hand in hand and the case of Panesa in particular is very interesting particularly because of the warning it gives to respondents and also what it says to claimants um, particularly about the possibility as a claimant of bringing in um, bringing two potential claims and, and potentially winning on both. The case of Panesa. Um, Ms. Panesa works for the council, I believe it was Coventry Council. And because of her disability, she had significant absences. And she had. Um, she applied to work for NHS England and there was an agreed reference that she had with NHS, uh, with the council. So, so the council give that agreed reference to the NHS and they offer um, a job. And um, the NH, uh, NHS call up the council and there is then a ill-fated conversation with um, perhaps an unfortunate, perhaps foolish, you might think, um, individual at the council called Miss Tennant. And um, Miss Tennant speaks to someone from NHS England about a number of things concerning Miss Tennant, uh, concerning the uh, Miss Panesa, sorry. But one thing Miss Tennant does say is this that she personally couldn't judge the claimant's suitability for the post at NHS England because of significant time off work that Miss Panesa had had. Then based upon this um, ad hoc conversation with Miss Tennant, they, uh, or NHS England, withdraw the job offer. So the claimant responds by bringing two Section 15 claims. It brings one against Coventry Council, one against NHS England. And she wins both. So the claim against the council goes as follows. Um, she's got a disability. And um, because of that disability, she has absences. And because of those absences, um, she ends up having a negative reference from Miss Tennant. So again, you can see the multiple causal links that lead to the something arising. Um, and uh, so the unfavorable treatment was again, the negative reference. So the negative reference to unfavorable treatment comes from the uh, something arising, the absences, uh, they're all linked together. So there's a prima facie case um, and the council couldn't really justify it because they had an agreed reference, they hadn't discussed um, what they were going to say or what Miss Tennant ended up saying with the claimant. Um, there were a number of issues there. So you've got the disability, you've got the um, something arising, you've got the negative reference, you've got the unfavorable treatment um, in, in what Miss Tennant said, and you've got no justification, you've got a section 15 claim. Against NHS England, the unfavourable treatment was the um, 
job offer, the something arising, again, multiple causal links, claimants disabled, leads to multiple absences, leads to mistenance, ad hoc, um, non-agreed reference. Um, something arising is that unfavorable treatment withdrawal of the job offer is caused by Ms. Tennant's um, comments. Um, they had knowledge of, uh, or constructive knowledge of disability too, because of what they'd been told by Ms. Tennant about the significant absences. And um, therefore that was a, a prima facie section 15 claim. They won uh, as well. So definitely a warning there for respondents, uh, definitely uh, an opportunity there in Peneza for uh, claimants. Um, and a bit more about the causal link, because of course um, claimants will have to uh, have the initial burden of proof. Um, you'll be familiar with the test for that, and um, to show that the, um, the something arising and the unfavorable treatment are linked. Um, now, one good feature and good point for respondents is this, and it's the case of um, Dunn and uh, Secretary of State for Justice. Um, and it's essentially the point that just because um, respondents are um, incompetent um, or uh, get something wrong, they're mistaken, their process is poor, um, that doesn't mean that the unfavorable treatment was linked to the something arising. So a prime example, and this is something which I, I see quite often from, from claimants, um, particularly those who are unrepresented, the unfavorable treatment might be a, I don't know, delayed grievance process. It might be uh, a grievance process which is uh, doesn't have an impartial decision maker. It took too long. There wasn't a proper investigation into the grievance, those sort of things. And uh, again, what is the reason for that? What is the reason, even if the claimant can prove that, that the respondent has done that? And cases like Dunn say that the tribunal need to look into the mind of the alleged discriminator. So whoever did a, 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 a poor job with the grievance process, whoever uh, managed the grievance process and made it take too long, look into their mind and are they acting because of the something arising? Usually they're not. Um, it might just be for other reasons. It might even be because they were understaffed and they were a bit incompetent in the way they went about it. That doesn't mean, of course, you've got a Section 15 claim. Treatment can be deplorable or incompetent, but not discriminatory. Um, it's perhaps unfortunate that the case of Dunn, which is my surname, is um, associated with the, the principle of um, matters being um, incompetent but not discriminatory, but I showed that's that's far away from my um, practice. But there you go, um, that's a useful case for respondents. Um, there is uh, also the case of uh, Charlesworth and Dransfield Engineering, again useful for respondents. Um, and it sets out that um, the something arising doesn't need to be the sole Thing, which leads to the unfavorable treatment, but it needs to be an effective cause. Um, Charles was particularly useful in the context of um, redundancy processes, but its, its scope is outside that. Um, it, it involved a situation where the claimant was absent from work for quite a period of time because of disability. So they've got a something arising from disability there. During the time they were absent, the respondent realized essentially that they could cope without them. Um, they were manager of their Rotherham branch and everyone um, sort of pull, or a number of people pulled in together to do their job. And the respondent thought, well, everyone's ended up doing um, Charlesworth's job while they've been off. We actually don't need Charlesworth anymore. We can save 40K by divvying up their role like we've been doing through their absence. So that's what they did. And they made Charlesworth redundant. 
and um, the tribunal um, and the EAT made a very fine distinction, which was upheld, that was just because the absences, so there's something arising, um, had given the respondent an opportunity to identify they could manage without the claimant, did not mean that they had dismissed because of something arising from disability. The thing that was, again, operating on the mind of the discriminator was not the absences, but it was the knowledge that the claimant wasn't needed to perform the tasks in the claimant's job description. A very fine distinction, but one that does have authority in the EAT. It's not the first submission I'd go to as a respondent, but it's one you can legitimately make if you can prove it. And if you can identify very clearly in the decision maker's evidence that it's not the absences, it is maybe something linked to that or close to that, but not as something uh, arising. Um, uh, again, uh, and I'll just skip over this briefly, there's a case of uh, Sheikh Salami and University of Edinburgh, um, which looks more into that um, test of it being because of the something arising, um, not the disability itself, which might sound quite obvious. But there you go. Um, one which I'll spend slightly more time on is a very recent case which, which came out in a, a, a few weeks ago, which um, I give credit to Daniel Barnett to, for flagging to me, um, as he often does. Um, but it's a case of Bodis and Linfield Christian Care Home. Um, claimant has um, uh, depression and anxiety. Um, and uh, because uh, she, she's disabled, and because of that, she engages in a period of rather unusual conduct um, where she deliberately spills water around the care home. She turns off the boiler in the care home and she draws facial hair on photos of the female staff within the care home. Um, unusual behaviour. And um, at the uh, disciplinary hearing, um, she gives... Um, amongst other things in her answers, short and evasive answers. And um, the tribunal dismiss her Section 15 claim because what one of the things that she says is that actually the short and evasive answers were something that arose from my disability. And that was something which they dismissed for. Um, which the respondent accepted. But the ET said, well, we need to look at Charlesworth. It needs to be an effective cause. And actually, the, the way that she answered the questions was, was, was minor. It was trivial, essentially. And um, the real reason and the main reason and the, the sort of true effective cause was essentially the things she did wrong. Um, the conduct that we just couldn't cope with and... Um, that was justified to dismiss for that, even though that arose from disability. But the EAT still upheld the outcome. Um, they still upheld the fact that um, these things were arising from disability, and they were unfavorable treatment um, in, in dismissing the claimant, but they were justified um, because of the impact on the care home and so forth. But the key point of the judgment was this, and it was particularly on this issue of short and evasive answer. What the EAT said was that even if something is only a minor component of the reason for the treatment, it can still be an effective cause. Now, I'd always understood effective cause to perhaps, yes, not be a, sort of the only cause, it doesn't have to be that. But I, I always understood it to mean more than trivial and probably more than minor as well, uh, whether or not they're the same thing is up for debate, but, but certainly I would have said it was probably more than minor. If the EAT have said no, um, even if something is a minor component um, of the, the, the reason for the unfavorable treatment, um, 
that can still make out a claim if you if it's the reason or, or albeit a minor reason for the unfavorable treatment. Um, so I think it's a warning for respondents and it makes it very important to, in the list of issues as a respondent, particularly identify what the something arisings are, because it's possible at a tribunal um, final hearing that matters such as this, such as the way someone answers questions, might be a something arising, and you might accept that you dismiss for them. It might be the case that maybe someone doesn't attend a, a meeting because of a disability, and that might be a, a minor reason for dismissal or minor reason for a warning. Bodis says that if that is an identified something arising, um, that that could be, even if albeit a minor reason for the uh, unfavorable treatment, enough. Um, and then suddenly respondents on the back foot and they need to justify it. Um, so a warning there as to the perhaps increasingly lowering thresholds, um, one could argue, of that causation test. And um, finally, I'll say very little uh, about this um, test of justification. Um, as respondent should identify and just maintain the response and make sure it's in the list of issues, make sure respondents lead evidence um, on the legitimate aim, um, and also it has to go to proportionality as well. Um, so make sure in evidence as a respondent, you not only set out the legitimate aim, but set out why um, conduct that might have been short of uh, your unfavorable treatment. So why something in a dismissal context, why something like a, a warning, final written warning and so forth, would not have allowed you to meet those legitimate aims. Um, why um, it, it wouldn't have been proportionate to do something less draconian, if I can put it that way. Um, sometimes it's tempting to say something briefly and say, well, these are legitimate aims, but make sure you need evidence on that, make sure you deal with the proportionality issue, and of course for claimants, that's worth looking out as to how that can be um, exploited. So thank you very much. Um, that's been uh, a pleasure to go through that with you and hope that's been, um, I hope that's been uh, useful. Um, I'll just see if I can stop sharing for a moment. Brilliant. Um, well, there we go. Thank you very much. Um, if you've got any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and we can see if we can answer them. But I appreciate it. I've been going for quite some time. It's 20 past one. Um, so I'm sure you'll have other, um, other things to get to. But um, thank you again. Thank you for joining. And um, it's been a pleasure to meet you. And hopefully it's been useful, particularly that recent case of um, BODIS, which is one I think we all need to be aware of. Um, so thank you very much.